Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Roach Growth listeners. Today, I have a, a very riveting one, exciting one that's going to get you out of your seat. It's all about insurance, right? Is that the best way to describe it, Jeff? Man, yes, absolutely. But I admittedly, most of your listeners will be like, insurance, yawn. But listen, <laughs> it's the industry of all things sexy, exciting, and just plain awesome. They just don't know it yet, right? It hasn't been pitched to them like that. So yeah, man, I've been looking forward to this ever since we got it on the calendar, Vinny. So thanks for having me on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, so we got Jeff Arnold today. He is the president of RightSure uh, Inc. Jeff, I mean, how, if if you're an elevator or someone, what's your elevator pitch? Someone goes, hey, Jeff, what do you do? How would you describe yourself and your company? Yeah. So RightSure is an insurance technology firm, right? And basically the tagline is we insure everything from pets to jets. Right. So there's the, the simple elevator pitch. The the longer, you know, one or two deck slide pitches, uh, we have proprietary deck to- technology, right? We call it our discount discovery technology that finds missing discounts or maximizes discounts for every insurance policy in every state. Mm. How, I mean, and I know it varies, especially from, you know, as you say, pets to jets. Um, I know it varies per uh, individual client, whatever. I mean, item whatever it might be how in depth of information does a person need to provide to get a kind of rough idea on um what the insurance cost would be what the premium would be yeah uh, great question and i would i would submit to your listeners this that that um the vast majority of folks uh shopping uh for insurance uh typically start on a website right because in our industry like in so many industries there's that trust versus suspicion that's got to be solved right Mm -hmm. they want to trust that they're getting the best deal but they kind of there's a suspicion so they want to start online first and get a quote and just see if it's even comparable right um but you know what what happens is uh caveat emptor buyer beware um, you get what you pay for. And if you don't know what you're looking for uh, or the coverages you need, you, you could end up um, surrendering coverages to, to save money. And that's what can, can be confusing. Uh, with respect to your question about how long it takes is, you know, h- how vast is the risk, right? How many, how many vehicles, how many homes, whatever, right? So um, the way we teach people and our policyholders um, is, is based upon my book, my best-selling book, How to Beat Your Insurance Company. And, and we start the conversation like this, because again, insurance puts people to sleep, man, it's boring. It, it just, it's something I have to have. But we submit to you this, if you systematically document, think, uh, peruse over how much of your income is spent on insurance, it'll change how you look at it. And if you think from health insurance, auto insurance, car insurance, umbrella, boat, I mean, all of those insurance items, it is a significant amount of money. And so just doing piecemeal, trying to save on everything, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. You should get with someone, we would suggest right your technology, of course, that helps you aggregate all available discounts and save you the most money. So I apologize for vomiting up so many words there, Vinny, but you know, this is a passion for me and I, I love the opportunity to spit it out. So not trying to control your podcast. So no, no, not at all. Okay, let's rewind a little bit, Jeff. So who was a who was a young Jeff? Jeff, Jeff, you know what I mean, was he into numbers? Was he into sales? I mean, entrepreneurship. Who was a young Jeff? No, young, young thank you so much, because that was many decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh I are from uh, Western Kentucky, right? So I grew up in a really small town in Western Kentucky. Um, My family consisted of my father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather, all ministers, Southern Baptist preachers, man, right? So I'm the first one in five generations not to preach. They still don't know what happened to me. Uh, But I I, I can tell you this, uh, and to be succinct, because the listeners don't want to hear all about my history, but I was 14 years old. Uh, working in the farm, standing on a hay bale with my best friend, Chuck. And this guy drives up in a four-door Buick 
with the windows up. Now that means he has air conditioning, man. And that is rich where I come from, right? So <laughs> he steps out from this Buick uh, with a clean starched white shirt. And I remember asking my friend Chuck, hey, what's that guy do? And he mumbled the words insurance or something like that. And so unbeknownst to me, that planted a seed that took about a decade to germinate and come to fruition. Uh, and that landed me into insurance. 30 years ago, right? But my first oh. exposure to it was that guy driving up. So young Jeff uh, working in tobacco, trying to figure out how to get out of this heat uh, and uh, uh, eat, pay rent, put gas in your car, whatever. Answered a job as cliche as it may sound, insurance salesman wanted. And man, Vinny, I, I, I was hooked. Once I started understanding that these are really legal contracts that we sell and you got to be able to talk to people, uh it, it was fantastic right so uh I, I fell by accident into a career that has been uh awesome beyond my wildest imagination did you get that first job with the the insurance agent that was driving the car with ac or was it <laughs> looking after? great great question i don't even know his name or where he was from but uh no th through a kind of a circuitous circuitous route i did um a lot of drama and stage acting in um, in in high school, and that led me to, of course, Hollywood, like everyone, North Hollywood, not the glamorous part you're thinking, but North Hollywood, into a studio apartment with four other people trying to make it big. And so I, I puttered around doing stage drama and, and, and comedy, of course, and a bunch of USO um, events, uh, but was clearly not successful at it. Uh, and so uh, at the time, my mom had moved uh, retired in tucson i moved back home to see her and uh thus i am still in tucson this day well that's interesting so you moved to la to become a an actor a thespian <laughs> yeah. uh when did you at that time were you doing any insurance or did you only wait till you went to tucson that's a good question. So, yeah, I uh, I had um, been very fortunate. Had a whole bunch of gigs lined up. I uh, did comedy with a lot of a lot of well known known people and uh, Bud Friedman's Improv and Mitzi's a Comedy Store. But this is you know late late eighties, the nineteen eighties. In case your people think it's the eighteen eighties, and I'm not that aged. But <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I had three months, no gigs lined up, nothing, and I just come off a a USO tour, a bunch of whole different military bases, and so that was fun but i had a 90-day haul in my calendar and so um i visited my mom like at thanksgiving come home for thanksgiving and realized mm, even if i got gigs it's not going to be a you know life-changing event uh it takes a long time uh or more intestinal fortitude than i was willing to give it and so i uh, had just moved to tucson uh by december and answered a job uh between christmas and new year's in december so uh Started insurance in January of, I don't forget the year, like 89 or 90. Did, how tough was that giving, I know you, I know you're so passionate now about insurance yet to move to Hollywood and go that route. You must've had a strong passion at that time to do that. So how, how yeah. hard was it to transition away? Well, I, I tell you, like, any of uh, anybody listening, look, you're you're going to know failure, right? And if you don't know failure, then you're not even going to taste success, right? Because it is not paved with gold. It is difficult. And it's a lot of journeys uh, and forks along the way. And so um, I think that failure, not getting called back from any acting gigs, not getting the role you wanted, uh, bombing on stage. Sometimes you hit a home run. Sometimes you just bomb. That toughens your spirit your hide, right? And so rejection becomes easier and easier and more palatable. Uh, and the thing about sales, right, which we sell legal contracts, is um, being able to hear enough no's to get to the yeses, right? And so I think, unbeknownst to me, my time in uh, theater and comedy was was prepping me for uh, lots of rejection. <laughs> Plus, I might add, growing up with red hair and freckles isn't like the path to easiness, right? So. <laughs> So I was used to rejection from a very early age and failure, but uh, difficult things. But uh, uh, when I started in insurance, it, you know, a lot of doors get slammed. But um, when you're passionate about something, people feel that there's an energy that's irreplaceable, unmistakable, and they are drawn to you. And been very, very fortunate that uh, I still have the same enthusiasm I did today 
uh, 30 years ago. I know a little more now than I did then, I think, but yeah. So when did that passion start coming about when you got that first job? Because I think there's probably a lot of people here. I mean, me, myself, I mean, myself too, talking right here is we have a passion for something and we slowly try something else, be it through failure, be it through, you know, understanding or changing, whatever it might be. And sometimes it takes a little while for some of us to go, oh my gosh, I'm getting the same kind of thrill that I got from the other passion that I get in this. Was it instantaneously for you or did it take a little time or what happened there? Yeah, admittedly, it was not overnight. It, it took a while. And um, probably like anybody, uh, you can, doesn't take long to recall who, where you pulled that passion in from. And there's two people that gave it to me. Uh, um, a guy named Tim Hampton, who's now retired in Florida. Um, I got to sit at his feet for for months, right? Just learning the business. And he had such an engaging energy and a passion for the customer side. I'm more on the tech side and, and, and automation and the, the coding side uh, now, but his passion was transferred to me, right? The mantle that Tim Hampton, uh, I, I took it from him because I'm like, this is where I'm going to get my energy, right? And then in the the mid 90s, I got to sit at the feet uh, of Michael Gerber um, every Thursday for three years. And he wrote the book, The E-Myth, Why Most Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. Now, that th was at my expense, right? Was getting coached by him uh, for three years. Um, and he used to tell me, Jeffrey, you're not going to be able to do what you want if you continue to make it, package ship it. You got to replicate it, wrap some technology around it. And so uh, I fused kind of both of their two passions, kind of adopted them. And so um, <clears throat> although, yes, I have a passion for it, part of it was borrowed and given to me by by people's whose shoulders that I get to stand on today. And everybody probably has a similar story to that. Right. No, no man is an island. He he got motivated by by wanting to impress a girl or whatever. Right. Or, or by a bigger house or a car. Um, and And that passion gets transferred. Now you're you're in the company. I mean, you're you're following these two mentors. Was so was it first uh, an employee kind of mentor relationship, and then with Michael Gerber, that was more of a coach. Yes, true. I mean, uh, it, and Mr. Tim Hampton was also he did uh, continuing education, so he would uh, drive around or fly around to different insurance. Um, uh, education seminars and, and teach people. And so he was, we weren't really in the same company, but I got to set his feet because all the education and learning happened through him. Mm. And then, uh, yes, absolutely. Michael Gerber's e uh, he had the e Academy that, you know, people could subscribe to. I was fortunate to, to, to be able to set at his feet and then his right hand's feet for, um, for three years. So it was, it was great. And, and look, it was only like an hour and a half every Thursday, but I filled up legal pad probably after every call, I would just leave the, the training and go to McDonald's and write out my legal pattern notes of what, what our growth uh, path is going to look like. How was your, how are you finding your original business when you first got into uh, th that sector? And no one is going to believe this Vinny, but uh, uh, this is uh, zero exaggeration on this. I promise there used to exist a book called the white pages and this was a physical book and i am uh, i am not kidding i would swear if this wasn't family friendly but i am not joking with you i would make without exaggeration 200 calls a day right lots of rejection again redhead and freckles and comedy get you used to that you get a thick skin lots of voicemails that people used to be able to screen their calls you know listening to a tape recorded voicemail uh, and those 200 calls a day I made every day without fail for months on end. And uh, the biggest month for me, I remember this is in the late 80s, maybe 1990, um, is I got 19 people to answer, six people to let me give them a quote on insurance, and I wrote three. Uh, but, you know, those numbers just kept going and going. And uh, um, it didn't take long that once you had a customer, it's just like we have now, right? Like RightShare is known for our famously friendly humans. Like that's uh, to the consumers. It's we insure everything from pets to jets. But once you get to do business with us, they call and like, how do you get people that engaged and that excited? You guys all drink the same Kool-Aid. The same would happen when I would call. Is once we got a policyholder, they're like, holy cow, you love what you do. Talk to my friend, uncle, cousin, everyone. And that same energy exists in our call center today with 70 plus people, right? Uh, people often comment on our famously friendly humans and you can read our Google reviews and see like, wow, what, what, what are they taking over there? 
<laughs> when now you're you're slowly getting business things are kind of coming through when did you actually start bringing on your first like admin and start kind of putting structure together yeah uh so that would uh, rather quickly because after about six months um we just moved into a small little office place and then started adding people uh one two three four at a time um and at our largest uh we had 200 plus employees um uh we we, we are no longer we're about 73 72 employees now um but that was from 2003 to 2007 before the Big financial reset. We were we were growing. We had forty different joint ventures with mortgage firms, real estate firms, uh, all, all over. And then of course that reset in 08 and 09. And so we had to shrink and uh, do a gravity pull and reassess and kind of re redefine ourselves. Was there any? Uh, I mean, um, were you worried at all as, as you were bringing on people? I mean, when you're burning and turning through the phone calls that's one thing but now you're basically managing people you're having other people do those activities there are money making activities for you i mean was there were you worried at all when you're bringing people on yeah absolutely i think you know as a at that time a small business owner or a startup i mean what do you what are you hyper focused on man revenue money dollars right mm -hmm. cash dead presidents whatever we're calling it right i mean that's the that's the uh, elixir that moves the whole thing forward and so when you start bringing on these hard costs you start to worry about it but everyone that's successful uh looks inside pivots their thinking uh, uh challenges their their prejudices and and develops a management skill or a style that lets them get to the next level. And those that don't aren't failures. They just didn't pivot right, right? They 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 might have wanted to be smaller in, in size, but um, absolutely with great certainty, laid awake at night, looking at the ceiling, going, "Oh, great! Now we got three mouths to feed and double the this, right?" And and at that time, computers were thousands of dollars a piece. I remember, right? And um, um, so if if the short answer is absolutely yes terrified but that's what makes talking to other entrepreneurs so great is they're going through the same fire that you've gone through or they're about to go through it right and they need to be encouraged what what allowed you to push through uh when, when failure is not an option right and, i mean I, it was <laughs> failure is not an option it's uh, uh yeah there were tough months there were times that you're gonna make it but you just keep on keeping on like like mm -hmm. anybody now when did you i mean it sounds like technology has been a main focal point to your current company was that always the case earlier on or how did this transition into more technology kind of work out into your business yeah always been enamored with tech right um even and now keep in mind that uh, in our industry uh insurance um uh, they they have this reputation as kind of a dinosaur and this monolithic thing. But uh, if you go back into your history, which I, I also wrote a book called The History of Insurance, um, insurance industries were the very first to amass you know hundreds of folks with typewriters doing lines of uh, you know just issuing uh, paper policies, and they were the very first industry to assemble cubicles like you see cubicles speak now in the 90s and 2000s insurance industries did that in the 60s and the 70s right and they were the, some of the very first adapters of fax machines and banks and banks of fax machines which we wouldn't call technology today right but in their day in its day insurance companies were the very first adopters of all those technology enter into um, email and websites and the ability to buy online and insurance industry embraces that so we have always been an industry that is an early adopter of technology and so that forces pretty much anybody in the industry to be to be tech forward or at least tech enabled what do you think i mean i guess when you're dealing with technology when you're dealing with contracts a lot has changed over the years um, but what do you think has been the, the biggest change, the biggest like struggle, heartache that you've had to go through? Well, I, I tell you what's, uh, the, the biggest struggle is just uh, converting an industry that's, 
committed to paper, uh, could get transferring that to digital, right? Um, and so, um, so much so that in 2007, I think we were featured in uh, both Forbes and Wall Street Journal for being early adopters of eSign, right? And this is 2007. Oh, wow. um, and, and so now, right, like 98% of our consumers sign on a smartphone. Um, I'll tell you what's exciting um, that scares a lot of people, but we're, I mean, we're embracing it in three different ways. And it's not a pitch for right sure, but I'll tell you how it, it's integrated yeah. in our firm. So how me, other listeners can, can do it too. So AI, artificial intelligence, right? It's, it's, it's growing in every facet and through every industry. It scares consumers on the insurance side because they think, oh, AI is going to somehow find I've done something wrong and not pay the claim. I get that. Mm -hmm. That industry, our, our industry struggles with trust versus suspicion, like we said at the beginning of the call. But we, uh, RightShare is leveraging AI in three different ways, and it's phenomenal. I'll just be really quick. A, it's listening in on the calls um, in our call center um, and, and not trying to find fault. AI is listening to prompt our famously friendly humans to deliver an exceptional experience on every call every single time. And just briefly, we'll just do a side uh, bar here. Um, with 70 something folks in our call center, you can imagine some are like me, they talk really fast, they're really gregarious. Some are really slow and introverted. And AI is listening and prompting them and saying, Jeff, you're dominating the conversation. Ask an open-ended question. Plus, it's also showing us that we're talking 70% of the time versus 30. For the person who's too quiet and introverted, it's forcing them, ask an open-ended question, use some more words. They think that you're being evasive, right? And so it's always prompted that, always listening. And then here's the home run part of it. At the end of the call, if we've checked off all these things, it's also prompting us to ask important underwriting things so like, do you use your vehicle delivery? Do you Uber or Lyft? Is there a business in your home, right? Does your jet get rented out? Whatever, right? Because we don't want a, an underwriting or claims issue. After you get through all this, it says, I think Vinny will give you a five-star review. And so if you look and compare us to other agencies, we're 10, 15, 20 times the amount of Google reviews because our AI is listening and prompting. Now that's not scary. Nothing's gonna be used negative against you, but our AI is listening. Another way we use it, the second way, is in our blogs. If you ever go to any of our, our RightShare blogs or any of our, we have 12 different web properties, all of that is written by AI. So all of our blogs have been written by AI since last July. And then the third way that, that uh, we use AI is in scrubbing legal documents. So Vinny has a home policy with us now. It's a private client or high net worth home policy, um, and it's coming up for renewal. Well, guess what? Rates probably going to increase because all rates are going up. So let's look at other policies. So what we tell AI to do now is scrub policy A to policy B, not by price, which Vinny's concerned about, but by policy language and coverage contract so that we can tell him these are the differences, right? A specific example would be everyone looking to save money on home insurance goes, oh, well, I want the one that's $500 cheaper. Well, yeah, but $500 cheaper doesn't cover wind or hail. So that risk is on you, right? Or $1,000 cheaper doesn't have a flood endorsement. And people can go to sleep on this because they think it's all you know, vanilla and, and the insurance, the only differentiator is price. But the third way that we leverage AI is identifying the differences in the coverage language and the policy language, letting our consumers know, and then letting them decide with their checkbook which one they want. Like, look, we know you want cheap, but cheap and good are sometimes diametrically opposed. So this is the language difference. So again, a lot of words, but uh, AI in our little space, right? In Write Your Space, it revolutionizes how we deal with customers. It's going to change all kinds of businesses too. Yeah, well, I, that's, I think that's a great way of having a, a I mean, basically a supervisor uh, listening in on the call center people uh, so they know they were going the right direction. Do you ever feel that down the road you're going to have the AI take over for the uh, call center person altogether? Uh, absolutely not. I, I don't see it on my watch or uh, anybody of our executives. Uh, our Famously friendly humans are irreplaceable, right? Um, and and AI can do some things. I, no one wants to buy insurance from an automated robot or whatever, in my estimation. Now there could be a generation, right, uh, that's coming up that 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 may be normal, but 
Um, Insurance is still a legal contract. It's confusing. It's wrought with suspicion and lack of trust. And so you need people, humans, famously friendly humans that you can trust, you can identify with, and somebody's throat you can go after if you've got questions, right? It claims time. And so um, but none of what we're doing uh, is, um, uh, is elevating or going in the direction of it replacing our humans because uh, what we're trying to do is make their workload lighter review the contracts, write some blogs, and assist them on the calls, but never, never want to replace uh, humans. I'll tell you a big failure point too, if I can. Uh, yeah, quick video. So we just, uh, like every company, we always have to raise capital. And so we're in the middle of a capital raise um, that is not going well. So when you talk about failures, right, this is a good, hmm. good, good example. We do a lot of things, right? We, we, we missed up. So we're doing a capital raise with, um, startengine.com uh free plug for them it's startengine.com so that's right here and so on that capital raise we focused on ai and consumers investors have responded with mm, seems a little crazy to me seems a little fishy uh we're not we're not we're not buying and sure. consequently our raise has not been successful right that's on me i was given guidance in the beginning that says look insurance is multisyllabic artificial intelligence is multisyllabic it's too many big words for people to get their heads around. I pushed back and I said, investors are more sophisticated. Uh, and, and maybe I'm not ins insulting the investors, but we didn't create enough fear of missing out or enough energy or enough confidence around the AI. So when we're talking about failures, we're in the middle of a gigantic uh, capital raise failure here. We're gonna be mm -hmm. fine, but um, AI, as we've been talking about it, and insurance scares people. Why do you, why do you think that is? I, I think because uh, they're, they're very afraid of recorded phone calls, right? And what's going to be used against me. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, again, it's um, because we sell legal contracts, we really are about a promise that when claims happen and if it's artificial or it's recorded, consumers get very, very weary. Even when you take a recorded statement at claims time, at loss time, uh, language change, body language has changed, how people talk change. They're afraid that they're going to be negatively impacted. And it's sad, it's horrible, but the reason why these things even happen in our industry is there's so much fraud, right? Perpetrated by the few, right? Now impacts the many. Most people are just, you know, good public citizens, God-fearing people, whatever you want to call it, paying their premium so that it claims time, it's there. There are those few that are just taking advantage of the system that impacts the many. Well, I mean, talking about AI and and uh, it incorporating your business, I mean, where do you see yourself, the company, AI uh, going in the next five years? Yeah, so we believe we're at the forefront of this, right? Of course, selfishly, uh, um, where we're seeing the most success right now is um, on the individual space. When I say individual, I mean personal lines insurance and in the niche of um uh, mass affluent, private client, high net worth, right? Uh, those folks who have two houses, more cars, yes, who, who aren't just shopping for value. They serve on boards. They want to make sure they have the right legal contract. And so consequently, um, AI scrubbing these contracts and saying, here's the difference between A, B, and C. Plus, if you have a waterfront mansion, uh, the difference in premium could be thousands of dollars, but here's the coverage. They're more sophisticated buyer and they appreciate this data. And so where we're going, uh, in this mass affluent high net worth space. And it's different by state, right? So for Arizona, mass affluent is a, is a home price above 600,000. California, it's 900,000. Uh, Oklahoma, it's 300,000. But they all fit in this niche. And those that are the ones that are really validating our business model and using um, our technology and our famously friendly humans. So that's the space we're going, uh, uh, it'll, uh, tear down into the, just the personal lines. But if you just have one auto or a uh, single home, you, you're more price driven than value and coverage conscious as a rule. Hmm. Is there something, I mean, talking to maybe individuals looking to get into the insurance field, I mean, is there any advice that you wish you would have knew back then that you know now? Yeah, like any startup, man, you're going to be hungry. Get get ready for the ramen. <laughs> get, ready, get ready for the top ramen, right? Uh, but um, it, like any 
we've been talking about technology a lot, but basically at the end of the day, every great successful person, be an athlete or whatever, is a salesperson at heart, right? So if you're in mortgage banking, if you're in real estate, if you're in you know flipping houses, insurance or whatever, as long as you you know, have good energy about you and a salesperson, you're going to be fine. Look, you got to know failure. You're, the, the universe is going to test your resolve to see how committed you are to it. The minute you make a decision, the universe will start throwing all kinds of stuff at you just to see how you are. And you know that because the minute you commit something onto your to-do list to change the direction of your company, the universe bombards you with all kinds of problems, people issues, technology issues, finance issues, just to see how committed you are. And so that would be my 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 pitch to your your listeners, Vinny, uh, is uh, uh, keep on keeping on, right? Go, go work against the headwind and, and come through it. So, Well, thank you, Jeff, uh, for being here. If anyone's listening right now and they're looking to uh, assess their pet to their plane, uh, what's the best way of them uh, reaching out to you, your company, and kind of uh, talking to? Uh, how, how do you say it again? A our, our famously family? friendly humans. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the the website uh, is uh, uh, rightsure.com. I'll spell it. It's R I G H T s u r e dot com and my personal website if i can um yeah. is uh jeff arnold dot com uh j e f f a r n o l d dot com well i i appreciate it jeff uh anyone's listening i mean how how so how long does it usually take i, I know we brought this up previously is it usually like a 10 minute phone call 20 minute phone call to assess it or is it longer shorter what's usually the the process jeff yeah, a lot of folks start online and quote themselves. Of course, we have that at rightshare.com. You quote your auto, your home, yourself. Um, and then depending on um, you know how complex your risk situation is, right? Um, if you're just looking for price, yeah, we can quote you with 40 different companies in a matter of 12 to 15 minutes. Um, if you want to understand the differences between those, well, that doesn't happen as fast. It could be 30 minutes. It could be another call with uh, you and your significant other, any any other interested party, um, could take 30 to 45 minutes to, to, to do it right. So um, just just as a, as a takeaway, um, start documenting and realize how much you're paying for all of your insurance. And then all of a sudden you'll start to realize, wow, I, I need to give this more attention. It's not just about 10 minutes to save 15% or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> at, at the front of my um, book, How to Beat Your Insurance Company, I, and it's not bragging, I just give this thing. I, I tallied up all of mine up until 2016, I think. And when you consider life insurance, health insurance, I have four kids, uh, auto, home, boats, everything, RVs, I had paid more than $400,000 in insurance, right? And I'm no super wealthy person, you too and your listeners have paid an insane amount of money for insurance. Now it's, start, it's time to start thinking about it in a different way. Well, thank you, Jeff, uh, for being here. Hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets. You could be, I mean, you you probably have a pet. If you, if you don't have a pet, maybe you have a car, a house, whatever it might be. Uh, go in the show notes, go to the website. And how hard would it hurt just to know you're getting the, the best price possible on that? And if you need any kind of real estate needs, feel free to reach out to myself, my team. We would love to help you out. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Everyone, please subscribe. Please share. And uh, make sure you're getting the, the bet race possible. Bye, everyone.